It's me. It's right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for taking time. We had open house tonight until 6.30 at Dallas Center. And so when I got down at 6.30, I slipped out the door and we made it here. And I appreciate the tables being set up and everybody waiting patient. If you have a map that we handed out last week, that could be useful. Uh, I didn't bring any other maps along. There may be some later on somewhere. But we are in 2 Samuel. And what we left off with was... Uh, Remember, we've got Jerusalem is right here. We're going to conquer Jerusalem tonight. Right now, David's in Hebron. He's, he's the king of Judah. Uh, over here on the other side of the Jordan at a place called Mahanim. That's where Saul's family, as everyone's fled out of Israel because the Philistines have occupied this area. Uh, Isbosheth, Saul's son, who's alive, is king here ruling this land, but he's really not because he's fled the land. His general is, as you know, Abner. And David's general is Joab. Uh, what has just taken place is Ishbosheth and Abner have had an argument. Uh, Abner, it seems, has been trying to make a play for maybe the throne or the crown. Uh, if nothing else, it says very clearly in Scripture he was strengthening his hand in this kingdom up here. Uh, he's taken one of Saul's wives, Saul's dead, of course, taken one of his wives, which is a, a sign of trying to take the throne or take some kind of a royal authority. And when Ishbosheth calls him on it, he says, well, he says, am I just a dog's head in your kingdom? He says, I'm going to do exactly what the prophet said. I'm going to hand the kingdom over to David. And he goes down and makes a deal in Hebron with David that he's going to organize this up here, the elders, and hand the kingdom over to David, all the other 11 tribes. And uh, there's a peaceful transition, a peaceful meeting. He leaves, and it's probably about a mile away. He's at a spring, a well. Uh, it's probably just north of Hebron, about a mile. Joab had, was gone at that time on a raid. He'd gone off on a raiding party. And that's, they're using raiding parties probably to help fund the kingdom, help pay for the administration. They'll go off and raid not their own people. They'll go down and raid the Amalekites and then come back with the plunder and, and make payments. This is like a fundraising activity. So Joab comes back. When he gets back, he finds out that Abner has been there and has made a deal with David. So he realizes he's no longer in control. He's concerned about this. So he sends for word for Joab or Abner to come back. He says, hey, he says, I've got to want to talk to you about this. So Abner's glad to meet Joab. He comes back to meet Joab in Hebron. And that's kind of where we left off right there in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, let me get my place here. 2 Samuel. 23. Chapter. Yep, chapter 3. We're right around well, chapter 3. Well, let's say chapter 3, verse. Verse. Uh, verse I was going to say 28. Let's go ahead to verse 24. What's it? What do you want to say? 22? 26. 26. 26. You will be, and I'll begin reading in chapter uh, 3, verse 26 in just one moment. I'm going to pray and start this class appropriately, and uh, we'll get started. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you for the chance to be here. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the direction it can provide for us, the strength and the spiritual growth it will provide. We do ask that we'd use it in our own lives, that we would be able to make good judgments, make good decisions, but also, Father, that we'd be mature and become, uh, be, be, be made into the image of Jesus Christ as far as our own behavior and our own attitudes. Again, we thank you for this opportunity, and ask that you lead us tonight in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so here's the situation, verse 26. Joel then left David and sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the well of Sirah. Now, no one knows exactly where it is at, but it seems it'd be about a mile. Uh, there is a location up there, as we mentioned. Now, when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the gateway as though to speak with him privately. And again, as you know, the gates at this time would be, uh, even at, at, in this area, at, at uh, Gezer or uh, 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 Megiddo, uh, there's six chamber gates, and, and that's what's left today. But there'd be rooms, and there'd be places that you'd go have a private meeting in there. So to have them go into the gate, it's not just going under this little you know ridge, and they're stepping into this you know between the wall. They have there's big rooms, and be an appropriate place to take two generals. That's where the elders of the city would meet. We see that in the Book of Ruth. We see that throughout the Old Testament. And Job is taken. Let's go into an inner room here in the gate and maybe negotiate. That's what he's anticipating. Well, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, as you know, verse 27. Now, when Abner returned to Hebron, Job took him aside 
and there to avenge the blood of his brother Ashiel, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. Now remember, there's three brothers, Joab, Abishai, and Ashiel. Abishai is still alive. Ashiel was chasing Abner at one point earlier, when we read last week, and Abner told him, don't chase him, don't chase him on your own age. And Abner turned around and thrust the butt of his spear into uh, Abish Ashiel's stomach and killed him. And that was the end of the battle that they had there at Gibeon. Well, anyway, he killed his, Abner killed Joab's brother. And remember, Joab is David's cousin through the wife, or is, is David's uh, sister, Zariah. Um, so anyway, uh, he killed, he, uh, he avenged the death of his, his brother, Ashiel. Verse 28, later, when David heard about this, he says, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May his blood fall upon his head of Joab and upon his father's house. Now, this is very interesting. May Joab's house never be without someone who has a running sore or a leprosy or who leans on a crutch or who falls by the sword or who lacks food. Now, there's some interesting ways of translating that word crutch. It may not be the best translation. The NIV uses crutch. There's other ways of trying to navigate your way through what he's saying. But basically, he's cursing the family of Abner or Joab for what he has done. Uh, it says, Joab and his brother Abishai murdered Abner because he killed their brother Ashiel in the battle of Gibeon. We read about that. And then David said to Joab and all the people with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and walk in mourning in front of Abner. King David himself walked behind the briar. They buried Abner in Hebron and the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. And so David, as a sign probably uh, before God and before men, He's going to show that he had nothing to do with this. He, he, he doesn't want this to be part of his kingdom's legacy of having murdered an innocent man, Abner. And so before God, he's going to mourn. But also, for political reasons, he's going to mourn for the people of Israel. Realize this was not a conspiracy. This was completely Job. And do notice, it, it's it, what David's going to do here to the men who came down from uh, the battle at Mount Geboa and brought down the, the, the man who brought down the report that he killed Saul. Uh, David kills him. We're going to see it in just a moment. We're going to read about Ishbosheth's death. David's going to kill them for killing Ishbosheth. The question that screams at you: Why does David not punish Joab for this? Uh, and you can see he's going to say in just a moment. We're going to read this in verse 38 right now. Then the king said to his men, "Do you not realize that a prince and a great man has fallen?" Talking about Abner in Israel this day. And today, though I am anointed king. Watch this. I am weak, and the sons of Zariah, that's his sister, are too strong for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil deeds. So David says right there, probably explaining, I can't kill Joab. He, his, him and his brother, uh, the sons of Zariah, are too strong for me. If, if it be politically, if it be militarily, David, David can't. He'll, he'll kill this man. He's going to kill the guys that kill Ishbosheth. David will hold them accountable, but he realizes he can't, he can't take Joab out for some reason. Remember, when he hands the kingdom over to Solomon, one of the things he tells Solomon is, do not let Joab go down to his gray, his gray head, go to his grave in peace. And one of the first things Solomon does is <coughs> kills Joab. Uh, but it's just interesting how, you look, you look how great a king David was, but for some reason, he, he knows Joab's wrong. He publicly dis, discredits Joab, but he can't execute him. He won't have him removed. So it's just, I don't necessarily have the answer for that. It's just interesting to see the politics and the personalities here. And Job's going to be with David. Well, we're going to see his name pop up throughout David's, David's uh, kingdom. Um, let's go ahead and go to verse chapter 4 now. Now, it says, When Ishbosheth, son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost courage. Now, that makes complete sense, right? Ishbosheth is over here. His kingdom is now occupied by the Philistines. His strength is Abner, his father's general. And now Abner has gone over to hand the kingdom over to David. Abner's dead. And Ishbosheth is ever realizing, I have, I have, I'm powerless. I have no idea what to do. And so he's, he's terrified. Now Saul's son, now here we get a little bit, okay, let's read this. Now Saul's son had two men who were leaders of raiding bands. Just like Joab had gone off on a raiding party here and then had come back to Hebron. There's two guys up here that are in charge of raiding parties, going off and fundraising, if you want to call it that, for the kingdom. And their names are, one was named Deanna and the other was Rechab. They were the sons of Rimmon the Barothite from the tribe of Benjamin. Barothite, that would be one of the tribe cities that was near Gibeon of the original Gibeonites that made a treaty with Joshua. Baroth is considered part of Benjamin because the people of Baroth fled from Githam and have lived there as aliens to this day. Now, verse 4 gives us some insight on Mephibosheth, and you all know who Mephibosheth is. Uh, again, realize, and again, I don't want to give you information you already have or bore you with this, 
But Saul, he's going to have several sons. He's going to have a son named Jonathan, we know, and Ishbosheth. Now, Ish, right here we're talking about Ishbosheth. Saul's dead, Jonathan is dead, but Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth is small enough that when Saul and Jonathan die on Mount Gilboa, as people are fleeing the land, his nurse picks up Mephibosheth and begins to run and drops him. That's all it says. He's going to be lame in both legs. Mephibosheth, as a little boy, figure, you know, he's six months old. He's one year old. He's two years old, three years old. He's young enough where he's got to be carried out. And he, and he, he I, I would say something like he, he broke both, both his legs got broke. They didn't get set right. Something like this. Some, you know, probably modern medicine it would have been a big deal. They could have healed him, got him, got him in a cast and reset the bones. But because of everybody fleeing, of the panic, the medicine at the time, uh, Mephibosheth's legs never were recovered. And so that's what it's going to give you insight here. While we're talking about the death of Ishbosheth, Jonathan's brother, Saul's son, they put a parenthesis there about Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. And that's going to play, and you know, that's going to play out big here later on. Because, again, please. David had a covenant with Jonathan that, that you and I will be friends, we'll work together, we'll protect each other. And Jonathan made David swear that that covenant would extend to Jonathan's family in case something happened to Jonathan. So yeah, they signed the, signed the insurance papers. And so now when David finds out that Mephibosheth is still alive, he's going to take the covenant that he has with Jonathan and he's going to show favor to Mephibosheth because of his covenant with Jonathan. And this is going to continue to pop up and out of the story as we go. Okay, verse 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was foul. Gee, I should have read ahead. I'm trying to guess how old he is. It's right there. He was five years old. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as he hurried to, as, as he hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. That's just parentheses. That's the end of that story for right now. Now, these two guys coming out of the raiding party, going off in a raiding, they see this as an opportunity. Abner's dead. They, they think it's good. Again, they're playing the chess game, the chess game that men play. They think, well, what a great opportunity. We'll eliminate this, this enemy of David and come down and we'll be heroes, probably get a prominent place in his kingdom. David is not, he's played the chess game before. When we saw him first start running from Saul, David was willing to play the chess game. And he always got burnt. He always burned somebody. There's always, he always lost that game. So he's learned in those, those 15 years that he was running from Saul, he's learned how to do what's right, do the righteous thing, and trust God. Realize that God is also playing the game. And as long as David stays in God's will, things will be fine. So when these men come down and offer David an opportunity to play the chess game on men's level, well, David's not going to be pleased with that at all because he realizes there's a bigger game going on and his job is to do what's right and follow God and not be taking God's responsibility of killing people and manipulating situations. And as you know from your own lives, once you start trying to manipulate situations, things get very complicated and you can't keep up and you often, you get hurt and other people get hurt and David right here, well, here we go. Here's, here's how this plays out. Verse 5, now Rechab and Deanna, the sons of Rimmon, the Barathite, set out for the house of Ishbosheth. Now you're going to have an interesting picture here of a palace. But remember, they fled. They're over here just kind of waiting to get back to their land. So this, is, this description of the palace and what's going to take place is like, how can you imagine doing this to the President of the United States? You can't even see him. You know what I'm saying? It's like... There's so many, so much security. These guys will just watch the story. It's like it doesn't even make any sense. Why is there no? Where's the, where's the security guard? Um, they set out for the house of Ishbosheth, and they arrived there in the heat of the day while he was taking a noonday rest, which is typical. It's too hot in the middle of the day, so he's taking his his afternoon nap. Uh, we see Saul doing there. Paul doing this the same thing in when he's working in Ephesus or some in Thessalonica, a different place. They'd work in the morning, they'd work in the evenings, but they'd take a break during the day. Well, anyway, that's what he's doing here. Abraham did the same thing. Uh, they went into the inner part of the house. I think this is where the king's at, as if to get some wheat. And now it's like so you're. You're going into the inner part of the house. This is where they're going to go get something to eat. Well, they're raiders. Maybe they're bringing back some plunder. Anyway, they had access to this part of the house where the, the grain was stored. Maybe they're going to replenish. Maybe they're going to get some wheat for the next journey, whatever, or next raid. They went to the inner part of the house to get some wheat, and they stabbed him, Ishbosheth, in the stomach. When Rechab and his brother Baana slipped away, then they slipped away. They had gone into the house while he was lying on the bed in his bedroom. Now what they're trying to paint right here is this man was completely innocent, was completely undefended. He was not expecting this. He, was, he could have easily been negotiated with. I mean, in this situation, his general's dead, his kingdom is falling. You could have negotiated with this man. You didn't need to kill this man. 
But anyway, he's sleeping. After they had stabbed him and killed him, they cut off his head, taking it with them and, and traveling all night by the way of the Arabah. In other words, they're thinking reward. They're thinking trophy. And the Arabah would be basically the Jordan River, Jordan Rift right here. They come down the Mahanim, the, the uh, Jabak River here, follow the, the Arabah down towards this way and head down towards Hebron. Um, they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to take your life. This day the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, against Saul and of his offspring. I just, I mean, you can just, that, they, they had all this time to plan that speech. But you notice how they're bringing the Lord into this. This day the Lord, they're saying the Lord has avenged because what we have did, the Lord has used our deeds to bring you the kingdom. And it's like, that, there's, when you talk about using the Lord's name in vain, you know, the commandment, we have all kinds of ideas, you know, using profanity and swearing. This is a classic case, I think, of using, this is using the Lord's name in vain. You doing something and then selling it as the Lord. The Lord led me. The Lord told me. The Lord did this great thing and trying to use it for your own advantage. That's exactly what, and David, now if you're playing the chess game, if you're a man playing the chess game, you'll bite on that. You'll, oh, okay, and you'll pass around using the Lord's name in vain as you give each other credit for doing the Lord's will. But David's out of the game. So when they come down and they say this to him, watch what David says. Verse 9, David answered, Recap and his brother Baana, the sons of Rimmon of the Barathites, as surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of all trouble, meaning the Lord delivered me, not myself. When a man told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing me good news, I seized him and put him to death at Ziklag. That was his reward. That was the reward I gave him for his news. Now at this point, these guys should be starting to get very scared. How much more when wicked men, he's identifying them as wicked, have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed. Should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? So David gave an order to his men and they killed them. They cut off their hands and their feet and hung their bodies on the, by the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in Abner's tomb, which is now in Hebron. And so again, you can see David right there. Again, demonstrating before God, I've got nothing to do with this. And to politically making a good statement, I've got nothing to do with this. Okay. Chapter 5. Now realize, what's interesting about this is you've got this prophecy going way back to when Samuel anointed the little shepherd boy to be the king. And this prophecy has been, been moving like a tidal wave, not quite as fast as we'd like it to, but God's been moving. And men keep trying to jump on that and justify their actions. Say, well, we're going to help. Remember, uh, different people have come along. David said, well, this is surely it. We're going to kill this king, king Saul, uh, uh, Joab's brother, Ab Abish Abishai. Uh, Ashiel, excuse me, Ashiel wanted to pin Saul to the ground. He says, this is, this is what the Lord spoke about. And David says, this is not how God's going to do it. So David's been resisting, creating the fulfillment of the prophecy. He's waiting for that prophecy to sweep over him instead of him manipulating the pieces. Well, now it's all in place. Chapter 5, verse 1. With this, all the tribes of Israel came to David. This is all the tribes up here in the north. I add Hebron and says, we are your flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. Now, they're forgetting those bad 15 years while Saul was trying to, you know, na name David public enemy number one, and all of Israel was trying to kill David. They remember the good days, and, and they are correct in that. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel in their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, now again, how many times have we heard people quote this prophecy? If it be uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail, from Carmel. If it be David's men. If it be the Philistines. I mean, everybody knows this. This prophecy is hanging over David, and everybody knows it. And so now here's the men of Israel. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. They said, well, it's time. We're going to give it to you. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So remember, the men of Judah have already anointed David king over Judah, but now all the tribes come down and they anoint him again as king over all 12 tribes. David was 30 years old when he became king, that's in Hebron, and he reigned 40 years, so he lived to be 70. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over Israel for 33 years. So he's, you can figure out how old he is. He's 37, 38 years old at this time. He's been king in Hebron for about seven years. And now he's going to be king over, or excuse me, uh, 
this may have taken place in about two years, so there's going to be another time where it's going to rain for about five years here in Hebron yet. Okay, so with that being said, David is going to, for a few years, is going to be king over all the tribes in Hebron. And that leads us to the next, next chapter, is right here, Jerusalem is, is northern part of Judah. It's right on the border. In fact, it, we know this, is if, if you go up here to the high place of Gideon right, Gideon right here, the, excuse me, Gibeonites right here, that's like four or five miles away, uh, you're in the tribe of Benjamin. So this is the land of Benjamin, this is the land of Judah. And so David is going to now go up here, and these Jebusites still occupy the city of Jabesh, or old Salem. And so that's where they're at today. Now, if you guys listen to WHO at all on the way, the, the, the drive type show with uh, Simon, yep. he's there right now. And he was talking about that. I was just listening to it on the way in here. He was, he's there right now. They're talking about the city of David and all this. So I mean, it's, it, it, they're saying a lot of things that we've already talked about. He's where they're getting some firsthand looks at it. And the, anyway, the, I, I would, this is where I could, I could deviate now for several weeks. We could talk about the city of David and, and all the things that are taking place there and what, what they have found. But archaeologically, there, here's, uh, there's this, oh, should I do this or not? Very quickly, here's the Kidron Valley. Here's the Hinnom Valley coming like this. And actually, this valley actually runs more towards, ends up running down towards the Dead Sea. In between there, there's, there's a ridge running right up in here. And on this ridge is Mount Moriah. This is where Abraham offered Isaac, right here, Mount Moriah. And down here towards the south part of that, just below that, is the city of the Jebusites. And that is very well protected. And we're going to read about it. It's protected by the Kidron Valley on this side. It, 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 we, some of us have stood in that valley and looked up at it. And it's like, you're not going to attack it. And it wraps around on the bottom. The Hinnom Valley wraps around on the bottom. And so it's encased in valleys all the way around. And it's not like a mountain where it's snow-capped and you got to, you know, but you can't run an army up there either. The only way to attack it would be from the north. And so there, on the north side, is where the fortress is at. And the government buildings are at. Uh, the big build, the big bottom, big stones, the big bases on them are on this north side. That's the strongest part. The fortress would be right here. And so it's well protected by the Kidron and the Hinnom Valley on the, on the east, the south, and the west side here. Protected by the fortress here. There's a water source right here called the Gion Springs. It's a natural spring that comes up out of the water. And they, there's, there's maybe three different channels that are used for that water. There's a channel that runs the, 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 the channel of the Gion Springs. Well, it kind of runs down through the, 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 oh, the waters of Shiloh, they call them. And that may be referring to the waters that just come off that and run down here to the Kedron Valley and water what is called the King's Garden. Uh, it, it's, it's a nice place. That may be where Abraham met Melchizedek and the king of Sodom, and that's, they're right in this area probably in the Kedron Valley. Uh, we can talk about that at other times. There's also going to be a, a way that they've got to run water into the city or come out of the city, go down and get some water out of that well. The, the, the first, the, the one water uh, source, the channel, runs out to water the garden. But they've got to get water into the city. It's right below there. So it appears what they, there's water. They, they would have also the springs. They'd cut a tunnel and have water kind of run under the city into a little bit of a channel. And then they have steps or caverns or something where they could drop their bucket down and get water out of a Gion Springs, a kind of a pool in here, like the lower pool. And, uh, and we can even see that. Something you can see when you go in there, you can see like some, uh, some ancient stairs coming down or drop, where you can kind of walk down some stairs and then drop your bucket down into that pool. So there's one uh, uh, channel going into the king's garden. There'd be another channel running in towards the city, forming a pool under the city they could dip water into. There's also a third called the Canaanite channel there. That's an old, going back to the times of, you know, 1200, 2000 B.C. Uh, and it's a dry channel right now. And then in 700 B.C., then they're gonna, Hezekiah is going to just take that and develop it and cut a ch channel all the way underneath the city. It's, it, it's all rock here. It's like a rock ridge. And cut, start the, a pool from here, cut a channel going all the way under the city, and put water into this pool over here called the Pool of Siloam. And then this, this is called Hezekiah's Tunnel. And we can still walk in that. Many of us, how many of you walk, how many walk through that? So we, all, we walk through that channel. So anyway, what we're reading about here, we're not talking about Hezekiah's Tunnel. We're probably talking about, and we're not talking about the channel that goes off and waters the king's garden. We're talking about somehow the people getting water out of that city. David's going to come up and take the city of Jabesh, or the Jebusite city. 
So he's just received the kingdom. He's going to move the capital eventually here up here to Jerusalem. And it's a nice place. It's not in Judah. It's right there on the border of Judah and northern Israel, or Judah and Benjamin. So here we go. Chapter, chapter 5, verse 6. The king and his men... Now, I spent more time telling you that than it's going to take me to read the account. I'm sorry. <laughs> the king and his men marched to Jerusalem. Now, if we go back to the book of Judges, the men that came in originally did take Jerusalem, and they did burn it at one time because it was conquered. And then they just abandoned it, apparently, and the Jebusites came back in and resettled it and reinforced it, and they've been there ever since, and they've been, you haven't been able to dislodge the Jebusites. Because in Joshua's day, excuse me, I said Judges, but in Joshua's day, the city was burnt and was conquered, but they didn't occupy it. And the Jebusites rebuilt, came back in, and took the city back again. And they've been there ever since, and no one's been able to dislodge them. But remember, we just came out of the days of the Judges and Samuel. I mean, there's been chaos in the land. I mean, so the, that hasn't been an issue. David wants that city now, though. Okay. Uh, he, he led his men uh, from Hebron to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who live there. The Jebusites said to David, now this makes complete sense, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. And, and, that's exact, and they have since the days of Joshua. They've got the Kidron Valley. They've got the Hinnom Valley. They've got the fortress at the top. You've got, you're going to have to scale this. You're going to take your military, and they're going to have to climb up the side of the, the, the Kidron Valley. And then when you get there, you're going to have to fight. And it's like, the blind, and really, the blind, we can just stand here and just push stones down on you. You'll never get up here. And it's the truth. And David knows that. But remember, going way back to David's younger days of fighting with Saul, what was he known for? His, he was crafty. He was skilled. He was wise. He wasn't just good at the hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he was crafty in his military strategy. That's why he's so successful. So here's what he says. They say the, the layman blind could ward you off. David cannot get in here, they said. Verse 7. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. See what it's called? It's called the fortress. It's not just a city. It's a fortress. Because that's what's on this north side here defending the city, a fortress. And it's called the Fortress of Zion, this, which is going to be called the City of David. And when you go there today, you've got Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. But south of the old city of Jerusalem, outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, is the City of David. Now here's what verse 8 gives you more details. On that day, here's how he did it. How did he do it? Run up the hill? No, he did not run up the hill. On that day, David said... Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say, okay, we'll stop there. So in other words, and if you read on in First, uh, first Chronicles, he says, you don't know, I'm not sure I want to overplay this, but he says, whoever can take this city will be my general. Well, now who's David's general? Joab. Is anybody going to take Joab's place? No, not without dying. So David looks like he's kind of putting out in front of everybody, okay, if someone can take the city of Jerusalem, you'll be my new general. And they kind of they may put some political pressure on Job. Well, you know what Job's going to do? Job's going to take the city. And so Joab, he's going to use the water shaft. And what would we read on in 1 Chronicles and in here, they had to come in or somehow coming into the pool of, uh, uh, of the Gion Springs, he got into that that pool under the city and then maybe shimmied his way up and, and he could see some of the cracks and, and, and the the tunnels and came up and like the Trojan horse, him and a couple men got into the city, snuck around, opened up the gates or something, and David came in. We don't know all the details, but it does involve Joab with a couple of men coming in and, and crawling up through the water shaft into the city of Jesus. And they're all looking at the wall laughing at David while they're being invaded through their, their water system. On that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft. Uh, to reach those lame and blind who, who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter, this enter the palace. And so what probably right here, this is now another thought, the blind and lame. In other words, the blind and lame become the Jebusites. Because the Jebusite says the, bl bl the blind and the lame can ward you off. So after David conquered the city, they, there's going to be Jebusites staying in there. They didn't kill every Jebusite. Because eventually David's going to buy what from, what's it, Ar Ar Arnuk, Ar Aruk, Arnuk? The Jebusite, he's going to buy the Mount Moriah. He's going to pay cash for Mount Moriah and buy it from a Jebusite man. He's using it as a threshing floor. And so there's Jebusites still farming in the area. But it says the lame and the blind can't come in David's palace. So in other words, this area right here, or maybe the city of David, because the Jebusites were forbidden, the, you know, they called, now they call them mockingly the blind and the lame. 
and they were forbidden. They were still living in the area, but they weren't allowed to come to the palace. That's just a comment there. Verse 9, David then took up residence in the fortress, that's Jabesh, and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward. Now, if you've been there and if we've studied Jerusalem, all this is just like amazing accuracy because outside, again, I, I should have brought you pictures, but if you go online and look at it on, on my website or just Google other places, you can find it. Because the city of David is sitting here on this, this ridge, dropping off into the Kidron Valley, this, the fortress is on this north side, a Jebusite fortress. David moves into the fortress. He's going to now start building it up, and he starts building it up. You're going to start falling off the edge of the building there, or you've got to build up some terraces. So what they're going to do, and that's exactly what Milo means. Milo means terraces. Just like in Jericho, they had walls. They'd have retaining walls that would hold the city up, and then they put the mud wall on top of it. Then they put up, just like you do your yard work, you put up some, some retaining walls and put your dirt and plant grass. They did the same thing here. They put up a, 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 a Milo or a terrace <laughs> filled in with dirt, make it solid, and then expand the city out. They could go so far on it. And today you can see, you can stand there and look at this huge structure of, of just stones that were built up. It's the Milo. It's, the, it's holding up a dirt wall or holding up the dirt so that you can build up on top of it. And on top of that Milo, on, on, the, on what was expanded there, are, is these huge stones for, it's not a residence. There are residences, there are homes. One of the houses is called the House of Ariel or Alel, or I can't remember what his name is, because they found two or three pieces of pot shirts in his house with his name on it. And you can see them. We saw those. We saw the, the little, little outside the Milo, outside the wall, the city began to expand. You can see the rain. I don't want to be too graphic or anything, but you, there's a stone there. It, it's the toilet seat that you can still see. It, it, it's laying on side, and you can see there's there's a stone cut out, just like you, if you're going to have a, a square stone stool, you cut out just like you'd like to. And right there beside it was a, a, a shaft going down to a cesspool. I mean, there's no doubt. It's, it's a, it, the residences are here. There's homes. Just like Rahab lived in the city wall, these guys were living in the city wall. Now, these were burnt out in 586 B.C. They, there's burn damage from the Babylonian invasion, but they're living outside the wall. But then there's this retaining wall called the Milo, and up on top of it is what is called today the, uh, the large stone structure. It's, it's, it's a large government stone structure right up here. I call it David's palace, or you can call it the fortress. It's probably the Jebusite's fortress that David occupied. He built it up. It was probably one of David's palaces, or it was his palace in the city of David. There's really no, in fact, on that drive time show tonight, they called it David's palace. I mean, you can't just say David's palace academically because it doesn't say this is David's palace. Yeah, you know, but you look at it and you put all this together. What, what is this government building right here on the north side? It's like a big, large governmental building. I don't know what it is. Well, it matches. It's David's fortress. It, it matches. So, I mean, it, it, and the Milo's there, the retaining wall's there, the residences are there. Yes, ma'am? This is north of the Temple Mount? Oh, no, it's not. This would be south of the Temple Mount. South of the Temple Mount. Yep. Uh, I, yeah, I am doing, I'm just okay, rambling up here. Is it north of Eon Springs? Or right around Eon Springs? It's, it's right, it would be... Okay. I can do such a better job of handing out graphics and you know that I'm doing right here. Uh, here today, right up here is here's the Kidron Valley. Here's Mount Olives over here. And remember, there's right up here would be Nob. Would be right up here on this side of Mount of Olives. Over here is another the Hinnom Valley, Guiana. Coming over here. And there's a ridge right here. And it's it's a big stone ridge. And it rises up this way. Kind of peeks out right here. This is like the high place of this stone ridge. Um, this is the Gion Springs would be right here. Natural water source. The city of David is this area right here. And so when, when David builds his city, it's, it's this area right here. It's right, there's the Gion Springs. Solomon is going to expand the city to include what is called Mount Moriah. It's still the same kind of stone ridge that kind of rises up, you know. Uh, but this right here, and oh man, I could talk forever about this then too. But this is Mount Moriah, and Solomon's going to build, this is the high spot, but he's going to build a retaining wall around this 
like a big sandbox. It's high right here. You're going to make a big sandbox. You know what I'm talking about? Like, not board, but stone wall around it. And then fill this all in so it's all level. Okay? And then put pavement on that. And that is the Temple Mount today. This is the, in fact, you can see this part of the wall right here. And once Rittmeyer, Lean Rittmeyer, identified, he said, we, there it is. You can see the top, you can see the top of the Ashler stones right there. Then the people, the, 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 a group of people then came in and put concrete on top of it and covered it up. It wasn't the Jews. But it's like, and they began to cover it up. And you can still see a little bit, but Rittmeyer's got some very good pictures. You can see this, this part of this. You see this corner right here. Anyway, Herod's going to end up coming, the, the Hasmoneans are going to expand it down this way, make it further. Herod's going to make it even further, coming down this way. And that is, that is what you see. This is the Temple Mount that you see today. And you can see the Herodian stones going around here and here. You can see them all the way along here. There's stuff underneath there. Right here is, uh, well, I can't, I can't quit. There we guess. This is the city of David. Today, when you go to the, the old city of Jerusalem, they've put this, this is a very rough drawing. You look at your Bible maps in the back. This part of the city is built with a wall around it from the 1500s. Uh, Sullivan the Magnificent built that wall. The Ottoman Empire, the, the Turks, built this wall around here. They did not put the city of David in that part of the wall. So this, when you leave the city of the wall, you go down here, this is the city of David. Right now, a lot of excavation is going on right here. Does, does that help? Yes, ma'am. Elon, how, how big was that Temple Mount? Because it seems to me like it was like several football fields. It was huge. It was, it was huge. Um, boy, no one's got their Jerusalem book with them, do they? Yeah. If you look up, flip over that, that, that will tell you. I've got the... So I've got the acres on how big that is. But yeah, it, it's very huge. Because it's, just studying it, it doesn't sound that big, but when we were actually up there on it, it was huge. For example, this is not a good thing, but there's trees growing on it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's trees. There's rows of trees. There's kids over here. They're having on the Dome of the Rock is sitting on top of what I believe, and many people do, including Lean Rittmeyer, is sitting on top of where the Ark of the Covenant sat. Now, here. not everybody agrees with that. Here you sit 38. 30 acres. This is 30 acres. The Herodian and everything is 30 acres. A lot acres. of paving stone. It's all covered up with paving stone. And so you'll have, you'll have a, a, a Quran study going on over here. You'll have the, the, the Dome of the Rock over here. You've got tourists walking around over here. And over here you'll have boys kicking a soccer ball around. They have a little soccer game going. I mean, it's like a huge, huge park. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily... And then, there, of course, there's Jewish uh, police officers patrolling it. It's crazy right now what's going on up there because... The Jews are being forbidden to pray up there. The Jews can't pray up there. That's one of the rules. So if the, and how do, you, how do you know if a Jew's praying? If his mouth is moving. And so it's like if you see a Jew up there and he's moving his mouth, it's like they start a riot because there's a Jew praying on the temple mount. It's, uh, and again, it, it, this conversation goes on forever. But we are, it's all right there. The city of David is here. David's palace is right here. You can see the Herodian stones that were built around the, uh, the, the Solomon stones. Uh, you can see the high place that was the threshing floor that David bought. Uh, and then you get into the politics of it, and there's a, there's a thousand different ways that you can go off on of that whole thing. And if you be careful, I'm going to say this, and, and then we've got to move on. But whenever anything happens in Jerusalem, you, you do what you want to. I believe Jesus is coming back someday. Peter talks about that people that they say, oh, we've heard that before, and, and that you know, people they'll just say it's never going to happen. They forget, deliberately forget that in the past, God did deliver. God did send the flood. Jesus Christ did come. God will deliver. Jesus will return. But just because it's been so long, Peter says, they'll say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be, it's not going to happen. I'm not one of those people. It is going to happen. I mean, who knows? I think Jesus Christ is going to return. But just because there's a riot on the Temple Mount, just because they're launching missiles back and forth, don't get too bent out of shape. Because when you go back and you study, again, without being rude or, or aggressive here, we are as a culture, my past, my past experience as being a member of this culture and my schooling is we are so ignorant of 2,000 years of history, not to mention what came before. I, I think Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and then... It's been a long, long, long time, and then I start going to my Methodist church, and, and I get saved, and now, you know, Jesus is going to come back. And all of a sudden, something happening in Israel, it's like, I forget, well, what happened for 2,000 years? This is, we're not the first people to go, you think maybe Jesus could come back? 
th this is not the first time there's been commotion in the Middle East on the Temple Mount. You go back to 19, well, you go back to any day, basically. You go back to 1967, go back to 1948. We just keep marching back. Well, yeah, that's when the Jews came back. Th this, is, this is impressive stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not impressive. But you, you've got to remember, go back to 1000 A.D., if you want to call us Christians and you want to just include all of us and say we, we Christians controlled the Temple Mount. We left Europe as Christians, again, however you want to play this out, and the Crusaders went down and slaughtered Muslims, slaughtered Jews, and fought their way into Jerusalem because they knew they were being preached to. I, I, we got the sermons. The re sermons are recorded. They were being told in their churches in Europe that if we will drive the, um, the, the, the pagans out of, out of Jerusalem, out of the Holy Land, then Jesus will come back. It was a huge moneymaker. I mean, it was the tele-evangelist of the Middle Ages. And people were dedicating their lives. They were taking swears of becoming knights. They were pledging. And there's treasure there. We're going to find Solomon's gold. There's gold at the end of the rainbow. And then they, went, they just went berserk. The Crusades. Read about it. And slaughtered people. They slaughtered Jews. They slaughtered Muslims. You go over there now. And I got burned on this in 19, what, it was 2007. I, I, I'm a Moshi shop. In Moshi shop. It's like, oh, I'm an evangel evangelical Christian. It's like, he says, yeah, you, don't, you guys don't know anything about history, do you? He says, you guys come over here. And he wasn't being rude. He was just saying, he says, you come over here thinking that you're going to convert us to Christianity because you know Jesus. And you want us to believe in Jesus. He says, you don't know that for 2,000 years, people who have followed Jesus have killed us, have driven us out of our land, have called us the Christ slayer. He says, now all of a sudden, you're all positive towards the Jews. Because we come back in 1948, now the evangelical church is like, oh, we're all good about, we're good with the Jews, we want to help the Jews. And the Jews are like, we, we've been here for thousands of years, a long time before the evangelical Christian. Now, you know, you got 2,000 years, not everybody's been evangelical for 2,000 years, you understand that. And so we come walking in there, and I, I just come like, hi. And it's kind of like, you dumb evangelical American. Just like, what are you talking about? Read your history. So then I read my history, I find out, oh, yeah, I got a lot to learn. I'm still learning a lot. But my whole point for saying that is if you want to look at a time in history where Jesus is coming back, look at 1000 A.D. or right around those times, 1200 A.D., when the Crusaders are taking control of the Holy Land. And they're dry. it's like something's happening. And then what happened on it? It fizzled out. The Muslims came back, took over. Uh, they, took, they, they took Constantinople. Now, 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 that, now you got, say, the 1500s. 14 something. Now also the Muslims who were driven back, they surge forward into Turkey. They take Constantinople, the fall of the Roman, the last of the Roman Empire. And now the Muslims are still coming up through Europe. It's like, well, what happened about with Jesus coming back? I don't know. We better get it. You know, and it's like, you understand what I'm saying? And so now all of a sudden they're shooting missiles from Gaza. It's the end times. Yes, Jesus is coming back sometime. But I don't think we've got this figured out. You understand? I, I just be very careful. Just be very careful when you, you know, your end time prophecies and start, everybody's, well, here's what's going to happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, just because, I, it, it's going to happen. I think the Jews being back in the land is a big deal. I think what's going on over there, you watch it, I think it's a big deal. Uh, but these things have come and gone before. It doesn't mean Jesus isn't coming back. It's just, we'll do what Paul tells the Thessalonians. What does he tell Maintain your lives, live a peaceful and quiet life, take care of your business. Don't, don't just freak out and everybody run to Jerusalem and stand on the mountain and wait for Jesus to come back. Take care of your business. Don't cancel your life insurance. Just Because if Jesus wanted you to know, he would give you the date. But you're never going to I think when you think you've got it figured out, you're wrong. Right? I mean, that, that's the way the system is wired. It's like, as soon as you get it all figured out, I've got it. Dang, this is it. You're wrong. Because you can't, you're not going to put the pieces together. It's this, I think it's designed that way. It's a mystery. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if, if I, I, I bored you with that. That's worthy of a conversation. Are, anybody want to please correction, insight, additional information? That that's I'm I'm breezing through that very fast. You know, I just covered archaeology and eschatology in a rant. Okay. <laughs> so what I shared with you is basically worthless information. Okay. We haven't got enough time to cover. What's that? I said I hope that wasn't my fault. Yeah, yeah. and that's because she asked a question about where's the Guillaume Spring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's your fault, right? Right. Yes, Larry. I think we had the Temple Mount for about 20 minutes. The Iowa 
group there. The right, yes, we, yes. We got a picture of them. Yeah, we, we, we had the, the Iowa Occupation where yes. we were actually sitting on the side of the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, yes. it was the, we called it, I remember it, the Iowa Occupation, so. 20 minutes. So. 20 minutes. It's probably not going to be found in your history books, but there for a while, Iowans occupied the temple. No one knew it, but we, we claimed it. <laughs> Soon lost it. So we got to get back on our plane and come home. <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, I appreciate you listening to that. And I am now, where am I at? Yeah, we're down on... Uh, I'm in First Chronicles. 11. 511. <laughs> uh, again, if you've, got, if you've got that Jerusalem book, um, that's got a lot of, lot of details in it as far as the layout of the land. It, it really, it just makes, it, it's really exciting for me, and I'm, I'm sure for you too, because you've read these verses before, and you just think they're lost in history, and then they go into archaeological work, and all of a sudden, the water shaft is there. The, the, the saying that the, the blind and the lame, they weren't being arrogant. It's like, it's been 300 years you haven't been able to conquer this because you can't f crawl up the wall and fight us. Well, David came in the water shaft. And then you, you've got the Milo being built, the retaining walls. And then, my goodness, you get, you know, even, oh, just archaeology. Archaeology, here's that, the Kidron again. Here's the city of David. Here's the Gion Springs. There's those houses outside the Milo right here. Um, in that rubble, they found two, and you know this, but they have found two uh, boule. Oh. Okay, and a boule is the is the clay. Like you take a drop of clay and put it on a on a scroll. And then you've got your signet ring, and you press it in there, and you press your. That's called a uh, a seal. You press your seal into the clay, and it leaves the imprint. Now. There's two men, at, it's in Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 1 and 2. I think that's the chapter. There's two men that are mentioned there, the names of the men and the names of their fathers, as being coming to King Zedekiah and wanting to come against Jeremiah. They were persecuting him. They wanted him thrown in a pit. Well, they were government officials that worked in the palace, and they came against Jeremiah. Well, if they were government officials, they had a seal. They would have had a signet ring that would have left a mark. And they would have sealed documents. Just outside of here, one of the houses there, by a, a Hale's house, whatever, there's a house that's called the Burnt House or the Burnt Scrolls. Because there's, it appears to have been like a government collection of, of government <laughs> documents. And everything was just burnt, just burnt, burnt uh, scrolls from 586 B.C. Nothing that was readable. But in there was just hundreds of little boule. And these were clay things that would seal a scroll. But because of the heat, those clay seals were, were, were baked. Uh, what do you call it when you, when you take a pot in the, 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 the kiln? Fire kiln. Kiln. Firing it? Fire. Fire. They're fired. There's yeah. another word. They're, like in a kiln? It's like a kiln. There's a word for that. I, I'm trying to think. Of. But anyway, they're hard. They're like little, little glass stones, and you can read on them. You can read on them. I went down to Tulsa. They were on display for a while. They were, went through Tulsa a few years ago. Uh, I went down and you can read. I didn't read it, but it's in Hebrew. It's got the names of the men and their the men and their dads' names, the officers of the king. It's got their names on two of them. There two of them were found there, matching exactly the guys. Same place, right time, right debris. I mean, it's just over and over. Every all this stuff is happening right here around the palace, and then that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. So anyway, let's go back to this. It's not much of a verse, but it's just it's a if if, some, if something gets me excited, it's archaeology that's confirming this because in our age as we wait for Jesus to return we are living in an age that's lost the Bible's lost credibility because it's been attacked I mean starting in the 1800s it's been overrun by scholars it's, it's not authentic it's just stories it's not legends want you to base your faith on something else let's all just love each other and be tolerant it's like that's not that's not what Christianity is based on love is part of Christianity tolerance is a character trait of God and of a Christian but it's based on this truth and with archaeology, before Jesus comes back, I can't control when Jesus comes back. I know he's coming back someday. But between his coming and while we're waiting, this archaeology is helping confirm the saying, let's get back on the foundation. Not, not believe in archaeology, but believe that this is more than just scribbled words that were made up by people. But this is documents of God's movement through history. And then we'll have something to base our faith on. We will be loving. We will be tolerant. But it won't be just, you know... Pointless, we'll be going in a direction. Anyway, here we go. Verse 8 of chapter 5. On that day, David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind, the Jebusites, 
who are David's enemy. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. Now that David's conquered, you can't come in here because you mocked us. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. That's that part down here. Mount Moriah is going to be up north, the Temple Mount. He built the area around it from the supporting terraces, or the Milo, inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. So you've got, already got a fortress here that he's occupied. Now he's going to build a palace beside the fortress. And that's probably where that Milo comes in and other stuff that David's going to be building alongside of that, a palace. Uh, and notice, mentions carpenters, stonemasons, and they were skilled up north in, in Phoenicia. They were skilled in this. And what you see in temples and palaces, the designs of the stones from that time period, it's similar to what you see in the Herodian stones and, excuse me, uh, the Solomon stones and the, and the stones around David's time here, is that they match. In other words, it's, there's no doubt that they, the same craft that built up there brought their skills down into the city of David, and it says it right here. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. Notice, it wasn't exalted for the sake of David. David was exalted, and the kingdom was exalted for the sake of who? God's people. God is doing something with the people of Israel, and David was that lightning rod to help establish them as a kingdom to get them into history. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Eli, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhiah, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphat, Eliphat, yeah. 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 That's just, that was just entertaining. Okay. Verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, but David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. And now we're on the, if you have the maps from last time, we're on the second page, we're on the first map, and I do have an adjustment on this map, and I'll leave you with this right here. Because again, he went down to the, the stronghold. Now we've talked in the, in the past as David was fleeing in the wilderness, we talked about Masada over here by the Dead Sea, a fortress. We've got different places, strongholds. Uh, David is now is coming out of Jerusalem. There's the valley of Elah that runs down towards the land of the Philistines. And right here is, would be Azekah. Uh, Sukkah would be over here. And when the Philistines come up, when the, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought up by the ox or the cows, they followed up here and they stopped at Beth Shemesh. You know, the, the priestly city right here. You know the story. Well, then when the Philistines, when David killed Goliath, the Philistines read back, they ran back down this valley. They were, so this valley is heavy traffic. They march up here like this. Now, this is the, the valley of Raphidim, or you can see right there. Now, right up in here, and I'll pick this up next week and maybe try to give you a little more research, a little more, you can Google it. I'll try and maybe give you a, some pictures or something. Right up in here, on the other side of this, there was a, 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 a fortress uncovered in the last couple of years. A big find. Because I've talked to you about the minimalist before. The minimalists are the ones who attack the Bible. They say this whole story of David was fabricated by the Jews to overrate their history. No one is going to have a united monarchy of all these tribes together extending to Egypt and going up to the Euphrates. It's fiction. It's impossible. There's no record. There's no, re there's no uh, uh, archaeological discoveries that support the fact that there was a... Now watch... This is Jerusalem, and it is the center of all of Israel. Do you understand? They all had their own tribes, but they all came down to this central location. It's a radical thing for the, from the days of the judges to have a central location of this major city with a major temple and everything in the land revolving around this city. It's, e it's easy to attack. Archaeologists or, or minimalists say never happened. The Bible gives the impression that this was the great city of God. It's overrated. Well, what they found in the last 10, 15 years, and especially with this find right here, they began, the archaeologists now are saying, you know what? It looks like there was a centralized, a centralized government in Jerusalem that everybody rotated around. And what you see right here, and I, 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 mean, I can't say this name. The city, it's, it's this right here. I, when we were in, I had 
Carl's wife, Mary, say it for me one time. I couldn't. I tried. And once you, once you can say it, it's easy. Kiribet Kiafa. And there's a better way of saying it, but Kiriaf Kiafa. It's a city right here. When we, when we drove out towards Azika, we drove right by it. I tried to snap a couple pictures from the bus of, up here. They're excavating it. And what they have found right here are large governmental buildings. They're not governmental buildings. They're, they're a palace, but they're loaded with storage, with food. Uh, they're loaded with military. In other words, this was a fortress not with, with residence for the king, but it wasn't a home base. It's exactly what we see right here. The Philistines came out, and they came up. Well, let me read this. And I, I'm going to quit after I introduce this. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. They're going to come out and kill David. We've got to stop David. He's, he's uniting everybody. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. That's all we've got is the stronghold. Now, it could be Masada, It could be these other places. But right here, I want to, and we'll just read this. Now, the Philistines had come and spread out in the Valley of Raphium. What is the Valley of Raphium? That is another reference to the Valley of Elah, where Goliath was killed. It's the Valley of Blood. It's the, why do they call it Valley of Blood? It's where this culture met this culture every time for war. The Valley of Raphium. So they marched out in full force. So right here, they're in full force. And David went out to the stronghold. He went over to Masada. It, it, no. I mean, we don't know where the stronghold is. But with archaeology... This place, this fortress right here, was designed overlooking the valley. It was it, you'd march out of Jerusalem, come right up here, and you're looking right down on the valley, and you're, it, it would it drive the Philistines back in. And it appears that David also, while they had were building this, they built this up here, this this city. Um, I, I, I'll have to give you more information. I want to talk about there's it's called the, the, it's got more than one gate. And they discovered it. The name means more than one gate. They discovered the two gates, and there's a palace fortress with grain and military weapons. It's as if it's designed as a, a, a fortress to fight against the Philistines. And I, So I'm saying right here, it's just for that little bit of what it's worth, is I think right now, that's what that stronghold is referring to, is this place right here. Because it, it matches up perfectly. And they, they've uncovered that. And there's more. They're, they're, they're continuing to excavate it every season. Let me finish this. Now the Philistines had come out and spread out in the valley of Raphidim. So David inquired of the Lord. Watch this. He's got the ephod. He's got the priest. He said, what should we do? Shall I go attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He says, as water breaks out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there. In other words, they carried their gods into battle with them. And David and his men carried them off. As a sign of plundering, when you carry off someone's gods, pretty much, well, you have not much, God, not much left. Verse 22, once more the Philistines came up, they came out again to the Valley of Raphim. They came back, they regrouped. So what, what, is, what was being recorded right here is David now is eliminating, where we started the chapter off tonight, the Philistines had overrun this whole land. Ishbosheth was over here. Now in the period of a few years, David has gone from Hebron to Jerusalem. He's establishing his presence. The Philistines seem to have been pushed back into the land of the Gaza land right over here, the land of the Philistines. And they're trying to make some last-ditch attempts. And David just keeps driving them back, driving them back. And he's going to force them back. And they're going to be neutralized until the days of Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar completely eliminates them from history. They are going to be eliminated from history in 586 B.C. The Philistines are no more. So when the Romans named the land of Israel, the land of Philistia, in 135, 132 A.D., they were making up history. They were. There's no doubt Hadrian was making up history when he calls this the land of Philistia or the land of, of the Palestines. The, the, it, uh, he was naming it after an enemy of Israel that had been gone for 600 years, historically removed from history. Okay, I'm going to quit with that, and I'm sorry we didn't get very far. Uh, please keep thinking. I'll pray, and then we'll pick this up next week, and hopefully we'll, we'll make some more progress. Take a look at that Jerusalem book. The good thing about that Jerusalem book is it was selling for... For, I give it away free, but it was selling on Amazon.com from $300 to $700 for about a year and a half, individual copies. And I've just checked. Somehow someone wised up and found out I was giving it away free. The price has dropped to now you got some copies being sold for $25. There's still a couple of people hanging on at $300 a copy on Amazon.com. Like, I'm sure nobody's buying it. I mean, nobody's buying it. They're just trying to sell it for that much. 
And I think they found out that someone's got a box of books or something, and they dropped the price way down. So now it's now it's being sold like all my other books, somewhere between seven cents and two dollars. So it's all balanced, you know, it all's been balanced out. Okay, let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much again for the opportunity to look into your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the archaeology that's going on that's confirming our faith. We ask that we would use this in a constructive way, that we would grow as Christians. And Father, we do want to thank you for your promise of the return of your Son. We look forward to this day, but ask that we would be empowered to be faithfully serving you during this time in our lives until he returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.